Okay, it's time to add a load balancer to the mix. We've got our application, we've got our auto scaling group. It's not really scaling right now, but it's a stand in for the real thing. So the next place we'll go is load balancers. So what we're going to do is create a load balancer. Uh, we'll use an application load balancer instead of a really dumb sort of classic, just plain round robin load balancer. Um, because with an application load balancer, we can do a few pretty smart things. We can have it do SSL termination. We can have it do uh, path-based routing, which is very useful for running sort of multiple types of services behind these. Um, they're very useful and a little bit more complicated, so useful to learn. So we'll use that application load balancer. We'll call this Tutorial Linux Web App ELB. This is going to be internet facing as opposed to internal. So if you, for example, set up a larger infrastructure where you are load balancing something else, for example, you have a service-based architecture where you you're running a couple of microservices, clusters of something that need to be load balanced between, well, you can use an ELB uh, internally inside of your application too. Ours is going to be a classic internet facing one. So that's just from the internet to our application. And we're going to listen on HTTP, so 80. Obviously, you can choose different protocols. We're going to go ahead and configure security settings. And because our subnets, we're actually going to just add all the subnets. These are the subnets in our VPC, so we're just going to put them all in there. We don't really need to tag this because we only have a single load balancer. So this is good enough for us. So configuring security settings is a non-issue for us because we're not actually using an SSL or TLS certificate here. Where if, if you were doing SSL termination or something like that, you would configure those settings here, like you would upload a certificate. But we don't need that. So what we're going to allow is um, just plain old TCP80, that is uh, HTTP, from all over the internet. We don't want to allow SSH through our application's um, load balancer because this is really just customer facing. Our instances themselves have public IPs, so we can contact them directly for SSH. So for this, we'll just name it Tutorial Linux ELB Set Group. The set group is unnecessary. I'm just making it nice and nice and plain what we're doing here. We're going to create that. We're just going to allow HTTP on 80. So from everywhere. A load balancer, an application load balancer, the new style of load balancer actually needs uh, target groups. So it works with something called a target group. And we're going to create one right now. We're just going to call this our regular application target group. So we'll just call this um, Tutorial Linux web app. We're going to allow HTTP on instance port 80. And our health check is just going to be root. So just slash. That should give us back our index page that you saw before, this welcome page. So here is where you would, if you were running a more complex service, for example, something that was listening on multiple ports, what you're basically doing is defining at least one target group. For example, if you're running more than, let's say you're running an admin application on port 8080 and a regular public application on port 80, some people do that, that's fine. What you might do is create this public target group here and then create another target group called admin or private or whatever. And here you would just change that port to wherever that public or private, uh, sorry, that private or admin app lives. And you would add some health checks so that this load balancer knows some HTTP path to contact that server on to verify that it's up. Does that make sense? So the load balancer is going to load balance, but it has a health check to make sure that it only balances over to healthy servers. Oh, and I've actually hit the character limit on this. Um, that's fine. We'll just leave it like this. Okay, great. So if you were load balancing across some number of instances that are not in an auto scaling group, you would configure those here. Like for example, you can see I could add these manually here, but I'm not going to do that because we're going to set this up in the auto scaling group 
itself. This is a little bit confusing, so just go ahead and create this load balancer without adding any instances to it. You've created the target group, which is just port 80 on whatever application service it's going to talk to, but it doesn't know about any app servers yet. You're going to create this, and you should see it pop up here. Okay, you can see some of the instance details down here. Sorry, the instance details, the load balancer details down here. And what we're going to do is go back to our auto scaling groups. Now that we have a load balancer, we're going to basically fuse this together with our auto scaling group so that the load balancer just, because the problem is, right, if we configure the three instances that are running right now for the load balancer, then if the auto scaling group adds an instance or an instance dies and the ASG adds another instance to replace it, well, that load balancer is not, doesn't know about that instance. It would have to be added manually. And manually is that word that should make your ears perk up and should give you kind of a sick feeling inside and should make you shake your head slowly like a good sysadmin and say, manually is not how we do things here. So let's figure out how to automate that. So the way is, you go to your auto scaling group that you've created and you tell it about the load balancer. So we'll just expand this a little bit so you can see the details. Here's our auto scaling group using this launch config, which uses our AMI that we baked from our EC2 instance with our app on it. You're going to edit this. So to fuse these together, all I have done is added the target group. This is just in a drop down here. So it would be Tutorial Linux Web App Public. The target groups are for the new application load balancer. The classic load balancer, just the dumb round robin, is here under load balancers. So there's no drop down. It can be very confusing. You're like, hey, I totally made a load balancer. I want to point this thing at it. You're not going to find it here. Again, the tooltip here just tells you this is classic load balancers only. For the new style application load balancer, just use the target groups. So we've selected the only target group we have. This is the public target group. If you wanted to have a private or admin site or service running on the same hosts, you could add that alternate target group here as well and then just have your ELB do the routing between them, the path-based routing. Or more likely, if you're running several services behind an ELB in sort of a microservices architecture, well then what you will do is create an auto scaling group for each service so that you can scale those services independently, right? Because if you have an app, I don't care what it is, there's going to be sort of like the web server side, like Nginx, and there's going to be the interpreter side or the running the actual application binary side. And then you might have a database part too. Those things will need to be scaled separately. You know, the first thing that's going to be a bottleneck, well, you should remove that from the instance and make that its own microservice. And then you would take the next microservice and abstract that out. That way you can scale things independently. If you have one app that's all one thing, one deployable unit, it's going to make problems during scaling because you're going to need to scale your application binary or your interpreter side of this whole thing way before you're going to need to scale the Nginx web server side. So you would split these into separate groups, create application load balancers that talk between them. You'll probably have like a front end app tier that talks through an application load balancer to all these back end services to get all the information they need to complete a HTTP response and send it back to the client. Does that make sense? So it starts looking like a more complex tree, but it's just adding more application load balancers and splitting out one monolithic application like we're running on our example app server here into multiple microservices. Might do a video on that specifics of that later, but I just wanted to kind of explain it here. So we've associated a target group that is a load balancer here, an application load balancer target group with this auto scaling group, which will fuse the two together. That load balancer will now know, oh, I am supposed to be giving this traffic to this auto scaling group. And what I've also done is I've added the other two subnets in my default VPC here. So the other availability zones are now represented here. So I've got a subnet in each availability zone, US West 2B, 2A, and 2C. If you remember, I originally just launched this in 2C, a single availability zone. An availability zone you can think of essentially as 
Amazon's abstraction of a data center. So if they have an entire data center outage at, let's say, the US West 2A data center, then you still have 2B and 2C in this region. So a region is made up of several availability zones or essentially data centers. Because we have added subnets here, what our auto scaling group was doing before was we had a single subnet, so it threw three instances in that subnet. Now we have three subnets, so what is it going to do? It's trying to give us the highest uptime it possibly can, the highest chance of not going out in a blaze with whatever data center goes down first or networking issue happens. So what it's going to do is rebalance. When we save this, you're going to see some activity happen. So all of this is done now. What it's done is rebalanced across all three availability zones. And you can see what it did to, to do that was this is our original launch here. And now half, a, half an hour later, what it did was this target group update. So we linked up the load balancer with the target groups. And as part of that, we changed the subnets here. You don't have to do that as part of this. I just happened to do those two things together. So what it did was two of these instances have to get terminated. So what it does is it launches a new one in one of the new subnets or availability zones. Then it terminates one of the original ones that were all three of them in the single availability zone. Then it launches a new one in the third availability zone, the second new one that we added. And then it terminates, you know, that it still has two instances in a single availability zone and it's running four instances and it should be running three. So it terminates that last one, and now we have one instance in each availability zone. And we did that with no downtime, right? That shift happened while keeping our application up. So it's a really useful tool, these autoscaling groups. So if we go to our application load balancer here, we can just grab the uh, A record that was automatically created to point towards whatever instances are running this load balancer, it's something that's kind of abstracted away from you. Let's paste that into a new browser window. So this is kind of hard to see because we've hard coded this is server one. So I'm going to break the rules here and actually log into these instances and change the markup so that instance one has server number one, instance two will have server number two, and instance three will have server number three. So let's take a look at our running instances here that are part of this ASG. They should all have the same name, and they do. Oh, and you can see the, the ones that were terminated here, right? So this is the dev server we originally cloned into an Amazon machine image, or AMI. These are all the servers that have been spawned as part of that application, that uh, autoscaling group. And two of these have been terminated because we rebalanced across the other availability zones. We started with 3 and 2C, and then we rebalanced to 2A and 2B as well. So these two that were too many in US West 2C were terminated. These terminated ones will go away after a couple hours. Okay, so what we're going to do is log in. I'm just going to sort by instance state to make sure we get the running ones. And I'll cut out this part, but what I'm going to do is just log into each one. And change that markup. Okay, so I've just logged back in here, um, logged into two of these instances, and edited the file that comprises this website. So now what I should see is when I reload this, I should see this round robining between the servers. Server number one and server number three. Make sense? So this sort of proves that we're just round robining over these. back to one. So congratulations. You've actually done a huge amount of stuff and implemented a whole bunch of plumbing around what right now is just a stand-in for a more complicated application. You have an auto-scaling group that's been defined the way you want. You could very easily make that thing scale, but for now it'll replace instances that you terminate or that if where there's been some kind of problems that have become unreachable. It'll make sure that you always have three running and it'll make sure you're balanced across the availability zones and subnets that you want to be in. You've set up a load balancer, which has been linked to that auto scaling group. And you can see there's some basic CloudWatch metrics. 
that are starting to come in on that load balancer. In the monitoring tab, you can see average latency, requests, errors, etc. So congratulations, you've actually set up a real web application with the sort of plumbing and infrastructure that a real web application would need. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at how to take the sort of stand-in, easy, static application that we've had in this video, and we're going to make that a little bit more complicated and see how that affects the infrastructure around it. So in the next video, we're going to take a look at how you would add an application here, something that's like a PHP application that might need an RDS instance, the relational database service that Amazon offers, whether that's Postgres or MySQL, uh, they've got other ones like Oracle, Aurora, plenty of others. We're going to see how that affects scaling, state that we want to keep on the app, things like that. So if this has been helpful, please do thumbs up, uh, leave a comment with anything that was unclear or requests for Amazon services to cover. But this should pretty much get you started on a practical level.